I didn't even have to say I was nervous, and I got an applause. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here today and to, to meet all of you. Um, and I, I want to build off of the, a lot of the work that I've done at UCLA Health, leveraging science to create policy changes to promote health and wellness. I look forward to working with you all on, on innovative solutions to this complex environmental plastic pollution issue. So as we know, Five Gyres has been integral in bringing the issue of plastic pollution into the global eye in partnership with many of the organizations and people in this room today, as we witnessed earlier. But Five Gyres, our, our mission is to empower action against the global health crisis of plastic pollution through science, education, and adventure. This symposium represents the closure of a three-year project that will help shape some of the next steps to address plastic pollution in California. And the Bay Area is a powerful region. It's a force because often the ideas and changes here impact um, every other community across the globe. So our afternoon session, uh, we're focusing on solutions. You know, how do we really take the science and convert it to action? And we want to use this data that we heard about this morning to influence and support actions that reduce plastic pollution. And we have a very impressive lineup. Our policy panel with five environmental leaders will explore local policy and management options. We will hear from experts discussing new ideas and technology and the steps needed to connect our efforts here in the Bay Area to the global movement to reduce plastic pollution. So it is very appropriate that we have Jared Blumenfeld here as our afternoon keynote. Jared was appointed California Secretary for Environmental Protection for Governor Gavin Newsom in, two, in January 2019. He has over 25 years of environmental policy and management experience and has roots in San Francisco where he was the director of San Francisco's Department of Environment. During his time in San Francisco, he was essential in passing the city's first plastic bag ban, which was also the first in the nation. So everyone put their hands together. <laughs> Mr. Jared Blumenthal. Cool. Um, first of all, so fabulous to see all of you. I feel like every single person I look at, I've known and we've worked together. So um, thank you for being here today. Um, thank you for what you do each and every day. Um, these are, maybe it's just my job, but these feel like darker times than, um, than other times we've fought together. Um, like it's amazing how much is getting done and yet how much we need to do to fight back against Washington. So a lot of my time is spent doing that. And my favorite opportunity, I was like, I don't even know if I was invited. I'm like, I really want to come <laughs> to recharge my batteries. So um, thank you for letting me speak, vent. Um, I want to thank uh, Warner in particular, San Francisco Estuary Institute. Um, this is, um, actually, I have something I was going to read. Um, I was reading it this morning. And um, it was a little book about tyranny, 20 lessons from the 20th century on tyranny. And um, there's one that I just really wanted to read at the beginning. Um, belief in truth is number 10, appropriate. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there is no basis upon which to do so. If there is nothing true, then all is spectacle and the biggest wallet pays for the most blinding lights. So to me, um, that's what science is for us. It's a, it's a way of exploring issues that we didn't know existed. It's a way of understanding the world around us. And empiricism, which seems like a really you know, 19th, 20th century concept of recording and replicating as a way of determining how we should act in the universe is really getting more out of favor each day. And science has less and less weight. So really, this is about a three-year scientific journey and what it led to finding. And now our job and this afternoon session is to 
give weight to that science, to help translate that science for people that don't have the time to read the whole report, to help decision makers understand what their next actions can be. So um, they used to say that the things that you can't see won't hurt you. And now we know from the 40,000 chemicals that inhabit the planet, from the trillions of pieces of microplastic that we see in our bay, um, that things that you can't see do hurt you, um, and we need to take action. And I, I think our biggest challenge is that there's so much happening. There's so many distractions. This is a headline today, but for all of us, this is an important part of our lives, and how we maintain a focus and energy to move forward really is the energy of the people in this room. So you are the community that will change this issue. You don't need anyone else, literally, the people in this room can make a world of difference. And our job is to support each other um, and to support this movement because there's a lot of people outside this room who want us to fail. Um, we are addicted to plastic, um, and that addiction is being fed by an industry that realizes with each new electric vehicle that's sold in our state, they need to do something else with those resins. They need to do something else and that something else is plastics. So when you think about um, all the research that's been done um, on the movement from cotton to polyester, or you know, thinking about all the, the, the results that talk about tires or the, the proliferation in single-use plastics, that's not an accident, right? That's a very deliberate campaign, which is only accelerating. And everything that you say, you may think, oh, it's based on science. Oh, you know, we've got a lot of public support in polling. This is going to be a really tough battle. So there are three recommendations that came out of the report that I want to focus on. Um, the first, um, many of you were, I, sp I spent till 4 o'clock in the morning with the governor on Friday the 13th of September when SB 54 failed. Um, SB 54 was going to be a comprehensive way of dealing with both the reduction um, and the recyclability and, comp and compostability of plastics. And it's kind of a lesson in, in two things. One, it was absolutely the right thing to do, and two, we will win. We absolutely will get this across the finish line. But it, yeah. um, the power and scale that California has as the largest state in the union, but also the fifth largest economy in the world, means you cannot make plastics or packaging just for California. Um, and so if we can get this, and we will get this across the finish line, it will have dramatic impacts for the rest of the nation. Um, I was up in BC, British Columbia recently, talking to them. About 95% of all the material in BC, not in Canada, just in British Columbia, ends up being recycled or reused in Canada. We, we had a myth, and that myth is you put our recyclables, um, and, and we kind of forgot the first two R's of reduce and reuse and went right to recycling. And that unfortunately led us to a place where we just exported our problem to a far, far away place. And we had no idea. We still have no idea. No one in this room can tell me in 1995 how much of the plastic we shipped to Asia was recycled. You just can't. But we believed we love a useful product. We need to reduce the amount of plastic crap that we absolutely don't need to be using. Um, and we need to set a frame where we can only buy things in California that can be recycled and reused in California. We can't be. Um, so this will take um, an enormous effort. Many of you who I know in this room were not in the halls of Sacramento in those last days. But it became like a hodgepodge of this is anti-ag. This is going to complicate local recycling programs. This is preemption. It's just, you know, now. You don't even need to have a focused opposition. The more unfocused our opposition, the more they got traction. So really, who are your assembly men and women and senators in the state? You need to know that. You need to talk to them about these issues. They are bombarded by lobbyists. Lobbyists in Sacramento seem to have lobbyists. Um, everyone has a lobbyist. I'm like, wow. Um, I originally kind of came with this, I don't know, Pollyanna-esque view that I just want to meet with the companies, 
not the trade associations representing the companies, but the trade associations, trade association has a lobbyist. And like, I, I, it just got so much that I was never meeting with anyone. So in order to get this comprehensive bill across the finish line, um, we, need, we need each and every one of you to realize how important this is. A lot of what happens in Sacramento just seems probably like, wow, I'm glad we're not dealing with that. This is something that you can engage on and re-engage in. Um, so SB 54 is a two-year bill. Um, we need to get this across the finish line, and, and it will make a huge difference. Um, the second that you have is, is explore green stormwater infrastructure as a way to reduce microplastics entering tributaries and the bay. Um, I, about two years ago, um, got a Filtrol 160 and put it onto my Samsung washing machine at home. And just as a test, and I also used every, a, a lot of different other devices just to see which worked best. Um, and Chelsea's obviously spent a lot of time, um, I don't know where she is, but helping us understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, thinking about, and this kind of goes into the third, but what we're putting into the stormwater system, um, I think a lot of it is probably, and this is all conjecture and scientists here in the room will help us understand this, but when you look at the vent from your dryer and look at the outside wall, there is a lot of microplastics clung to the wall of your house. And then that blows um, onto the streets, and then it rains, then it goes down the storm drains. As well as, um, I spent a lot of time, bizarrely, dealing with tire tread deposits in Lake Tahoe. Everyone thought that Lake Tahoe's lack of clarity was because of um, nitrate runoff or algae. Turns out, the majority of the problem is from tire tread. So both the tire tread itself and the asphalt goes into basically PM 2.5, very, very, very fine particulate, and that clouds the lake. So we already have a campaign to, to really focus on this issue. And the answer there to many of these stormwater deposits is, I don't think there's as many tire treads that come off a bicycle. I don't think there's as much rubber that erodes at the bottom of your shoe. So thinking about public transit, getting people out of their cars, all the things that we need to do anyway are just exacerbated by this issue. The more we can get people onto alternative modes of active transportation, the less you're going to have these issues. The, the more that we can work with manufacturers to have a sheddability standard so that we understand exactly how much plastic microfiber is coming off their clothes. And on the third one, which we'll talk about in a minute, just understanding how we can build this in into what we're doing. The, the, the issue that we all deal with is there's huge fatigue in the public to these environmental issues. They just keep coming one after another. And they don't know, the public doesn't know what to do. And you should, you don't need to have a PhD to be able to take meaningful action. At the same time, individual action in and of itself isn't going to solve it. It needs to be combined with regulation. It needs to be combined with good citizen behavior in our company. So in this case, like thinking about stormwater, we um, had the first trash TMDL, and you heard from Mark Gold. Um, because of him, LA passed the first uh, trash TMDL in the nation. Um, we now have a trash policy at the state board. Um, and we have legislation that Mark told you about uh, as it relates to the Ocean Protection Council. The state board is also charged with coming up with a classification system by the, this summer, July 2020, of how to measure and understand plastic microfibers and then to do more work between then and 2021. So we're doing some of that analytical frame, but we're, we know enough from the report that Warner and Five Gires came out with today to take action. We don't need to wait for the next report. Um, and we need to think about what are the concrete things that we can do, whether it's low impact development, um, that helps really think about bringing natural green infrastructure into our planning. You know, most planners that you talk to just love the smell and feel of concrete. Like, let's just put concrete everywhere. Um, we know with rising sea levels um, that there are multi-benefits, multi-benefits from dealing with low impact development and green infrastructure. So when it comes to what we can all do, going to your board of supervisors going to your public utility commissions and your water districts and saying, there's a different way of thinking about this that's going to solve many problems from microplastics 
all the way through sea level rise. And then finally, your priority number three for the afternoon and for the rest of our lives is to identify and prioritize ways to prevent fibers from entering wastewater, starting with a pilot study on add-on filters for residential, industrial, and commercial washing machines. So this is like a no-brainer, right? We already have a lint filter on our dryers, and the reason for that is there were house fires, right? No one forced the dryer manufacturers to put it on. They were like, this is a problem. We don't want houses burning down because then no one will buy our dryers, <laughs> right? So in this context, we have a similar emergency. It's just happening a little further away from the machine itself. So I think there's a huge opportunity for washing machine manufacturers to come to the table and say, we want to do the right thing. They all go to the UN and talk about their commitments to multilateral development goals and how they're going to help the environment. This is an easy one, right? It's not that hard. I traveled all the way to England, um, to the northern part of the country, to look at a device that will cost between five and fifteen dollars that can be put in every single machine that reduces 99 percent of the microfibers coming out of washing machines. This is super doable but it needs all of you and your grandma and your mom and your dad and everyone in your community saying we want this and when a manufacturer does come out with one you need to go and buy it not the ones that are three dollars cheaper that don't have them on. So this, this we need these solutions to be implemented quickly because without showing progress on these, it just becomes another chronic issue that people don't understand what they can do in their lives. So making this report actionable is about legislation, it's about individual behavior change, and it's about corporate responsibility, and together we can make a big change. Thank you. Jared, I think we've all identified that the house is on fire, and that's why we're here today. Uh, so my name is Anna Cummins. I'm the co-founder of Five Gyres, and thanks to Eric Copeland taking the helm as executive director, I'm now trying on the title of deputy director, and thrilled to be here. So I have um, the role today now of MC, introducing our speakers. I have the dubious distinction of trying to keep us on time. Um, so with no further ado, um, actually one more a point to make when you are asking questions and or speaking into the microphone please speak very clearly into the microphone because we do have a live stream going out right now so I now have the pleasure of introducing Cambria Bartlett and Damian Montesinos to the stage they are from Airs for the Ocean and they are going to highlight the importance of youth engagement in driving policy change environmental awareness and public education thank you both so much All right, hello everyone. My name is Cambria and I'm 15 years old. My name is Damien, I'm 16 years old. So me and Damien are both part of an organization called Airs to Our Oceans. Airs to Our Oceans is a youth-led nonprofit that is working to empower kids to take action for our planet. Um, we are active around the world. One of our big things is our Summit for Empowerment, Action, and Leadership. This summit brings together diverse youth from around the world to be empowered, make films, develop public speaking skills, learn about these issues, make an impact through policy, and work towards solutions. Well, yeah, uh, so during this past seal, we went to Sacramento to talk to some uh, legislators uh, while we were there, we were very nervous because we've never talked to anyone uh, like legislators. So it was very uh, nerve-wracking for all of us. Uh, while we were there, there was a person that was very dismissive of us because uh, maybe it's because he didn't really care, probably that, and we were young. So I mean, that's his that's his choice not to care. But. Uh, during our stories and our uh, passionate stories, I feel we feel like uh, we made a change and impact on his choices and his opinion. Uh, so after we left the Capitol building, uh, everyone, uh, including my friends uh, and the staff that was taking care of us, felt empowered because 
we went in there as youth and we talked to legislators and we felt like we made a change. So we're youth and we're making this change through policy. We talk to our government leaders internationally at the UN in DC, at our state capitals and locally. Um, but to effectively talk to these congresspersons, we first have to learn about the issues. And how we do this is by connecting with experts. For example, Dr. Chelsea Rockman, along with some various others, have been my mentors in learning about plastic pollution. Our experts get us out in the field and help us start thinking critically about these problems. They also review fact sheets and papers that we write and just generally help us learn about the issues. Another way we learn is by attending events like this one. And after we learn about these issues, we are able to take what we learn and make an influence through policy. Being youth, I think it's a really impactful and inspiring experience to go talk to legislators and also learn about this science. I think that more kids like us need to have these opportunities to learn about a real world problem and then make a real world change. So um, as you all probably know, um, plastic pollution has a huge impact on climate change, which is some, one of the biggest problems we are facing today. Um, last week, we saw that there was this huge conference at the UN focusing on climate action. Um, during that conference, 10 members of Airs to Our Oceans, um, Greta Thunberg and some other airs from our, or other kids from around the world came together and filed a petition to the United Nations um, Committee Rights of the Child. So these are the heirs on that panel um, talking about how climate change has impacted them. Greta is back on the table and standing up is a member of our organization talking about how his island of Palau has been impacted by climate change. While this all was happening at the UN, people around the world were striking for our climate, demanding climate action. We youth have a powerful voice, and we know that all of our leaders need to start focusing on protecting future generations, not just their reelection. We need action now, not in 2030 or 40. We no longer have time left to wait. to say as the mother of a young uh, daughter, I'm particularly inspired by seeing the next generation take, take charge. We now have the special pleasure of having Council Member Sophie Hahn here. Um, Council Member Hahn was the lead author on the much talked about Berkeley Ordinance, the Disposable Free Foodware Ordinance, and she will be joined by Martin. Come share the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Sophie Hahn, and I'm a Berkeley City Council member. I represent District 5, and I had the honor and pleasure of working with Martin Bork, the executive director of the Ecology Center in Berkeley, which has always been a great leader on zero waste and plastics and, and other related issues. Um, and I was asked uh, just to say briefly a little bit about what it took or how it was that we were able to actually um, make this single-use plastic and a single-use <laughs> single use disposables uh, ordinance uh, a reality in Berkeley. And I think the main message that I would like to convey is that it's not enough to know the right thing to do. I think that's one of the mistakes that the environmental movement makes, which is knowing that you're right and thinking that's enough because you also have to know how to do it right. So first you have to know what is the right thing to do, and then you have to know how do we do this right? Because regardless of whether what we're doing now is right or wrong, 
When you ask people and systems to change, you're asking real people who are invested in the status quo in a variety of ways and not because they're bad people, because that's just the way things have been, you're asking real people to make changes. You're asking people to change personal habits. You're asking businesses to do their business differently. You're asking suppliers to supply different products. You're asking for a change in the real world. And if we really want to get where we need to be quickly, and I commend the young people who just spoke, looking for them, um, for the urgency that they are providing, but <clears throat> we still have to do it right. Otherwise, we don't really get there. So I think the main thing, theme of how we worked is partnership, partnership, partnership. Um, the Ecology Center, um, Martin, they came to me. That's, you know, I don't want to take the spotlight here. And that's why I asked for Martin to be here with me, because this was a partnership. The, he had already convened um, a whole bunch of organizations, and I'll have you explain a little bit about that as well. And they were ready. They knew what was right. They knew the right thing to do, and they, they had talked about it a lot. They had a 30-page um, proposal of, of, of legislation, but they needed then they needed to translate that into legislation that could be passed, and they needed to get a government body to do that. So they came to me um, and to the mayor, and we said, okay, we'll do that. So we took the right thing, and we turned it into legislation that could work. And one of the things that we emphasized and that I emphasized very strongly was we had to view the businesses and the people in Berkeley as our partners, not people who we needed to tell them, you're wrong, you don't do things right, you use plastic, you throw things away, but our partners, the people we need to have buy-in from, and we need to help them make a transition from the world the way it is right now to the world the way we know it needs to be. So we did a ton of consultation with our business community, um, we went and visited restaurants, and we looked at really simple operational things. Where do, they, where do their supplies come from? Where do they store them? How big are the spaces where they store their materials? What are their personnel issues? How do they train people? We heard them tell us really basic, everyday problems. There's a lot of turnover. They can't keep employees. They have to retrain people all the time. New systems are really burdensome for them. So, you know, you have to go and work with the people on the ground who are actually going to have to implement the change. And kind of mashing together the highest aspirations of, of the advocates, some of whom I'm now seeing are in the room, <laughs> um, with the reality on the ground of what it actually takes for change to happen, I think we were able to come up with something that really works. Um, and, and then the Ecology Center organized, um, with all our other partners, um, organized a movement. They organized hundreds of people to come to our city council meetings and testify. They talked to anybody who had a question or concern about this newfangled legislation that was asking a lot of people to change how they do things. We ended up with a unanimous vote at the city council. We have very high buy-in from the businesses in Berkeley, and we are going to make this transition in a way that is manageable for the actual people who have to implement and that also gets us to the right end. So you got to know the right thing, and then you have to do it right. And I'm going to give um, Martin just a couple, a little bit of my time to uh, our time. Well, I'm, I'm on the next panel. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but I just want to um, say that working with the mayor and, and our lead author, Sophie Hahn, Council Member Hahn, was just an amazing uh, experience. I know many of you may have champions like them in your um, districts but or cities or counties, but um, it's pretty amazing to have somebody who could really take our ideas and not only help to formulate them into much tighter, cleaner legislative language, um, but then work it through a public process that really engaged the stakeholders, 
uh, without compromising the goals. And there were some things that we ended up backing off of, but they made a lot of sense was we really heard um, deeply from the business community, in particular the small business um, community. And some of those things were like, hey, we're going to need to study this or take a little bit more time. Um, so there may be a, a 2.0 that comes up down the road. But let's get over some of these, these major hurdles first. And um, taking a commitment to reduction of disposable foodware overall, not just plastic, but uh, the compostable and paper and non-compostable, non-recyclable stuff too. Um, and really focusing on that being the central core message. Jared mentioned that you know the plastics industry has jumped over uh, reduce and reuse and gone straight to recycle, and that's um, a big problem that we're facing now globally. Um, this is trying to bring reuse back. It's trying to uh, focus in on reduction, and I think that's what's innovative ab about it. Um, it's what's powerful about it, and we hope um, that we can use this uh, uh, experimental space that we have in Berkeley to um, try something out that can um, spread more, more broadly. Thank you so much, and um, and if, if anybody wants uh, to bring this to the legislators, you know, in your communities, I'm always happy to to talk with legislators and provide um, everything we did and explain to them how we got there, um, because little by little it'll spread throughout California, throughout the country, and then I think we'll see counties, and then we'll see states taking it on. And there's always that tipping point, the critical mass, and, and then it's taken up at a higher level. So happy to help um, bring other jurisdictions along. So thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. And I think we will take you up on that. We are uh, looking to Berkeley very closely in Los Angeles. Um, to do something comprehensive, and I think that just speaks to the Bay Area's continued leadership in setting the standard that the rest of the state adopts. I'd, I'd like to invite Carolyn Box back up to the stage now to talk about data-driven solutions to microplastic pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. All right, everyone. It's nice to be back up here. I am going to be talking through some of the science-based solutions and policy recommendations for the project. But first, I'm going to walk you through an example highlighting how important science can be in terms of pushing or uh, supporting action moving forward or change. So this is a sample um, that we collected in 2012 on our Great Lakes expedition. And what we didn't realize the week that we were picking through these samples and analyzing them, and this was before all of the extra uh, sophisticated lab analysis. So we were using a microscope, picking through, looking at the particles. But what we didn't realize was how important these samples were going to be to build a movement uh, statewide and nationally against microbeads. So many of the people in this room helped build this momentum and worked for years to get this microbead legislation passed statewide. But what we also saw was that local data can support local action. So we mentioned the earlier study uh, from SFEI, SFEI, the pilot study of 2015. And this study came out just days before the statewide policy was put in place. And then as we all know, the policy statewide in California moved to a national policy just months later. So th this concept is really why the San Francisco Bay Microplastics Project was designed from the beginning to develop uh, recommendations based on the science. And so we uh, organized uh, an expert committee of individuals to come together and look at the science and generate some recommendations. So our policy committee um, had 22 experts. Um, this was a diverse group of people. Uh, we had uh, nonprofits uh, helping further legislation and uh, environmental efforts in California. We had individuals from stakeholder groups from the wastewater and stormwater. We had experts from the textile industry. Um, and this group of people throughout, uh, as the results came in, 
we really discuss what kind of action could we suggest moving forward for the Bay Area and then also uh, statewide. So we generated a report um, that really comes up with 10 recommendations, and you heard some of them already from Jared. Uh, but we, I'm going to walk you through quickly uh, some of those recommendations and then what kind of, what kind of uh, support the science can give those. So first, we all are discussing uh, comprehensive policies that reduce single-use plastics from different angles. Um, we have a huge success um, that happened earlier in Berkeley, uh, and we want to build off of this. Uh, and we're hoping to replicate that in other communities. We're ending um, session now in Sacramento with a big push for comprehensive statewide. Uh, and we, as we heard, we are all going to be back at it next year. Um, and we're hoping that our science and the results coming out of this project and other projects can support these efforts. So really, uh, what we're seeing in the surface waters and the other compartments we can use to support that there are microplastics in the bay. And as we all know, larger plastic items break down into microplastics. And we can look specifically at the polyethylene and polypropylene um, fragments in the surface water. We can look at the foam particles. Um, and we can use this to show that we should reduce single-use plastics upstream. And we can look at our beautiful um, model as well to really show how that, that the particles in the bay are actually entering um, the ocean systems um, to make the story uh, better connected to the rest of the world. We're hearing about something new and exciting, at least from the microplastics sort of um, world. So this is the use of green stormwater infrastructures um, and using these as a tool to reduce microplastics. So many of us have heard about these before, um, but there's the new study that SFEI um, carried out that showed that this is also successful at removing microplastics. Um, and we can look to uh, the stormwater uh, pathway for data to support this. And we also know that we need to do more research on the stormwater system to understand uh, uh, more information about how uh, these particles are making their way into the systems and what kind of particles. So we do know that black rubbery fragments likely uh, linked to tires are in these systems. Um, and we can explore what kind of solutions that, th that could look like. But we do need more research um, uh, moving forward. And then filtration has been discussed. Um, this is a hot topic in the uh, microplastics community. Um, and really, as we uh, uh, discuss this in our uh, stakeholder groups or in our um, uh, committees, we it seems like it's, there's more of a focus of understanding where to put these filtrations. Um, it would be great if we could just say everyone needs to have a, a, a filter, uh, but we really need to be confident when we're putting out a solution that it's a, a good solution to be putting out. So uh, we are suggesting that a pilot study or something of the sort, which we will hear more about in the afternoon, uh, would be put in place to understand where would be the biggest, uh, most effective place to put these filtration systems. Is it the commercial um, facilities or residentials or all of them? So it's um, after we do some of these studies, we can uh, understand what kind of uh, legislation, let, uh, what kind of policies we could put in place moving forward. And then we know that this is a pathway of microplastics. Um, as we're seeing in the study that stormwater uh, does seem to have more uh, particles going into the bay, but we know this is a spot that we can control microplastics right now. So I think this is an opportunity where we can look at this, op at this um, solution as something that we can put in place right now. So I, I think um, that's how we can support this idea moving forward. So other ideas that were coming um, discussed and that are described in the recommendation document is really looking at there's some questions around airborne uh, microplastics, which I think we've gotten briefly talked about today. But that is something that has been identified as a question. Um, so that is more, study, more research is needed there. Long-term monitoring, um, helping to understand if these policies are effective. Um, and we've heard this concept already this morning. So we want to understand if we're putting these in place, we want to putting in policies in place, we want to um, understand how effective these these can be long term. And innovation is something that is somewhat related to you know, filtration, but other ideas um, of innovation are, can also be explored. This is really a solution that we 
in order to solve the problem of microplastics and plastic pollution, we really need to go way upstream and design products differently and um, look to new ideas. And uh, we're really hoping that our youth can help us come up with new ideas as we all um, work together on this. Uh, and then building connection and community, as we just heard, is really key in a lot of um, uh, campaigns and just efforts in general. Um, so we know there's a large trash um, effort, or trash reduction effort in California through um, uh, the trash amendments. Uh, and better bridging those worlds is really important. And I think our project has really started doing that. Um, and so I hope that we can really continue um, working uh, as a movement together to really tackle the problem of microplastics and macroplastics in California. So something super exciting that we heard about this morning is the Ocean Protection Council um, is developing the first ever, I double checked on this, the first ever microplastic strategy uh, statewide. And this is identifying research goals, but also looking to policy. So we have an option here as this is being developed to really uh, give our opinion and influence what ends up being in this strategy. It is the first ever. <laughs> Uh, and so I guess I'm going to leave or introduce Anna here in a second or bring her back up here to really uh, get us thinking about what kind of goals should be included in this um, strategy. And she's going to speak um, a bit more, uh, I guess, global on the issue and bring it um, to a larger level so that we can really think um, on how we can best uh, set some goals in this strategy. All right. Thank you. Thanks again, Carolyn. It is truly, well, clicker. It's truly been an honor to work with the team, this amazing team at SFEI, um, as well as Dr. Chelsea Rockman, our friend and colleague, and many other people in this room on this project to better understand microplastic pollution in the San Francisco Bay and connect the dots better between the materials and the packaging and the single-use plastics that enter our nearshore environment and the ocean di dynamics that carry our synthetic waste out to sea. Now, having spent the first four to five years of our work at Five Gyres uh, doing scientific research on plastic pollution in the world's oceans as well as freshwater systems, we've seen firsthand the power of vetted science to drive upstream policy change. Now, we've also seen that voluntary change at the corporate level can be slow to advance. But today in 2019, we don't have time for slow progress. We need big and bold solutions, and we need them immediately. So we're thrilled to be releasing the reports from this robust three-year study on plastic pollution um, and to really advance upstream policy change with this study and do something comprehensive here in California. Because as we've heard all day, what we do here in California can have global implications. Now, before we get into the next uh, panel on, on policy solutions at the local level, I do want to give a sneak peek into a new study that we've been working on with Five Gyres. Um, now, this is not yet published, but should soon be published, so the data will soon be available. But we hope that this can offer a ray of hope for um, the power of well-timed and effective policy interventions for truly impacting plastics in our oceans. Now, we heard uh, this morning, and I think most people are aware of some of the frightening production increases over time in the last 60 years. Uh, Suzanne discussed this morning this increase from roughly 15 million tons in the 60s to 311 tons in 2014, and projections that are, are expected to double or even triple by 2050. And at the same time, oh, that's why I have the clicker. There we go. At the same time, I think many people are aware of this incredible study and the work of the, the entire movement, the Break Free from Plastic movement, looking at some of the projection increases. Um, this report from the Center for International Environmental Law uncovers some of the petrochemical build-out with plans to increase plastic uh, production by 40% in the next 10 years. And so we assume that there's been a linear increase uh, between plastic production and plastics in the ocean. But the data may tell a bit of a different story in terms of that linear increase and may offer this ray of hope. So our director of research, Marcus Erickson, and my husband, for full disclosure, along <laughs> with our friend and colleague, Wynn Calger, who's an ocean modeler, have been combing through all the available data on ocean plastics since the 70s and coming up with global estimates based on the best available data at five-year increments. 
And what they found uh, was really unusual. Um, as we'd expect from the 70s and rising up into the 80s, there was a linear increase. But there's a bit of a dip, as you can see, um, from around the 90s until 2000, a decline in ocean plastics, and then a steady increase uh, going forward. Now, this does mirror what we saw in our 2014 global estimate led by, uh, led by Marcus, where we found that the ocean is not the final resting place. The ocean surface is not the final resting place for, for plastics. Natural ocean dynamics will kick plastic back out. Gyres will wobble seasonally and deposit plastics back on shorelines. We heard this morning about ingestion. Plastics will, will fragment until they're negatively buoyant and sink being sequestered in the seafloor. So there is a bit of a, a, a push and pull. There are inputs and there are outputs. So with this dip in the 90s um, up until 2000, Roughly, there, there was a bit of a homeostasis, if you will, where the amount of plastic emissions, plastic inputs into the oceans were roughly equivalent to the amount being kicked out. Now, what could have accounted for this decline and then the steady exponential increase? Well, it turns out that this decline here, oops, this decline here um, really mirrors the introduction of Marpole Annex 5, which prevented the dumping of plastic at sea. So we are hypothesizing, and this will come out very soon, that that, um, that that parallel between inputs equaling outputs was around the same time that Marpole was introduced and plastics were prevented from being dumped at sea. Now that steady increase and that exponential rise since then simply um, is a matter of globalization. I love the quote from Captain Charles Moore, who has inspired many of us in this room, that plastics are the lubricant of globalization. And with um, population increases and production increases, um, production has outstripped, inputs to the ocean has outstripped the ocean's natural ability to kick plastics back out. And another takeaway there is nature is incredibly resilient. If we leave it alone, things can eventually shift. Now, I do want to make very clear that looking at it this way is very much an ocean's lens. And I think all of us in this room know that there are problems with plastic on public health, social justice, um, and uh, community health in, in overseas countries that transcend the impacts to the oceans. I'm talking about the fact that plastic is uh, made from fossil fuels, that the extraction of that fossil fuels has impacts on marginalized communities, um, the export of our waste carries social justice implications. So there are many, many um, problems with plastic that go beyond ocean plastic. Um, but today, we are looking at plastic um, uh, science in the ocean and carrying forward some of the policy solutions based on the data. So coming back to the oceans, how can we, um, how can we come back to those, pre, uh, those 1990 levels where the inputs roughly equal the outputs? How can we return to that homeostasis um, and, and come back to levels from the 1990s? Well, it turns out that it wouldn't take that much to get back to 1990 levels. It would take a 25% reduction in emissions and in inputs for 10 years consecutively to get back to those 1990 levels. Now, 25% is a big number. There's no question about that. But given the fact that plastic pollution has taken, um, has become prominent on the global agenda, that there's the EU directive, that there's really ambitious and comprehensive policies like we've seen in Berkeley, that number does give us a North Star goal that we, can, that we can strive for. And we do think that's achievable. How can we achieve that? Well, we feel very strongly, and the reason why we are all here today is that we think policy and enforcement and regulation and smart policies can help us reduce emissions and reduce some of the strains and the impacts on our oceans. So the next panel is going to talk very specifically about some of these lessons learned at the San Francisco, the Bay Area level, because as we keep talking about what happens here can change the state, can change the country, can change the world. So with that, I want to invite Jen Jackson from the San Francisco uh, Department of the Environment up to introduce the rest of the panel um, and, and talk about some of those lessons learned uh, for policy approaches. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Hoping this is on. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we have a panel of five that's going to talk about local policy, and then we also have one person who's going to talk at the federal level. So I'd like to go ahead and invite our speakers up. So Miriam Gordon from Upstream Solutions, and Martin Bork from the Berkeley Ecology Center. I'm calling them up in the, the order that we're going to go. We don't have a lot of time. 
And then we have Chris Summers from EOA and Sherry Lippiet from, the, from NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So we are going to talk quickly. Each of us has about five minutes to talk about policies and programs that each of our agencies have implemented or organizations have implemented. And then we're going to have some time for discussion. And so with that, I am going to go ahead and step away from that other mic <laughs> and hand the baton over to Martin, who's going to speak first. So I thought I was second up, but uh, we'll jump right in. Um, I'm Martin Bork. I'm at the Executive Director of the Ecology Center. We uh, have been in Berkeley since the run-up to the first Earth Day, so we're about to celebrate 50 years. Um, and uh, we've been, we were the first curbside recycler uh, in the country. We started in 1973. This is Berkeley's dump. This was the old solution. Um, it was dump it in the bay, or, and then it became burn it. And then there was this big movement in the 70s to reduce, reuse, and last choice to recycle. Um, and, you know, out of that came uh, uh, growth in, in recycling and expansion, which um, ended up being collect, sort, export. You guys are pretty familiar with that. But when we got into it, there was a, a, an idea that we should first cause no harm, and that's something that the Ecology Center has held on to pretty tightly. Um, we got into it for um, some pretty basic reasons. We wanted to reduce uh, waste, we wanted to reduce toxics, we wanted to save natural resources, we wanted to create jobs, we wanted to do something local at the community level, and we wanted to confront consumerism. Um, from the beginning, um, really starting later in the, in the late 70s and 80s, but really from the beginning, we had big questions about the recyclability of plastics, and uh, this is some old artwork from some of our newsletters going back a few years that I hope you'll appreciate. But, um, you know, it was environmental, labor, health, the markets, hello, we're dealing with that now. Downcycling, meaning turning plastic into something that's sort of like carpet, maybe one step away from uh, the landfill. Um, and we have a long history fighting greenwashing around plastics. And I just wanted to note that the situation that we're in today that I'm assuming most people in the room are familiar with in terms of national sword, China policy, and um, export policies around um, recyclables, both plastics and paper, which is highly contaminated with plastic. Um, a lot of this comes out of um, things that we could have predicted. You know, the bottle bill in California, we moved from rewashable, re reusable glass to plastic bottles. Um, in, in the 2000s, single stream recycling expanded massively. I wonder if that growth curve isn't also related to changes in the recycling industry. Um, 2010s, the American Chemistry Council pushed really hard this collect all plastics program. They went city by city, convincing every city, you know, just throw it all in the recycling bin and let the magic uh, elves and, and gnomes sort it out at the, at the, back, uh, at the back end. And then, um, um, you know, recently I just wanted to, you know, our, our most recent thing was focused on reduction and getting back to re reduce as opposed to just let's collect and recycle more. Um, this is the story that the American <laughs> Chemistry Council has painted for us. Um, they've been really freaking good at it. You know, those chasing arrows make you think everything is recyclable. Uh, of course, the reality is much grittier. Uh, we've done some tracking with GPS. We know the realities. We've actually, at the Ecology Center, stopped exporting uh, our plastic as a result. Um, and we could tell you, you know, wind it back, Jared, I don't know if you're still in the room, 1995, how much of that plastic? Probably about half was recyclable. And once it gets to Asia, they do their darndest to get every last pass possible recyclable scrap out of it. But there's still half or more that's just garbage, and it's going to get dumped somewhere. Um, you guys have seen the trend. What I don't know if you saw this morning is the major growth in plastic is in packaging. And for as a recycler, of course, this is um, you know, huge impact on us. We used to have four grades of paper. That's gone away. We have two now. We used to have two grades of plastic. Now we've got four. Um, you know, the math is totally upside down in terms of the market. So it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, next decade. This is what's happened to pricing with plastics. So when you're paying to get rid of stuff and export it overseas, you've got an incredibly perverse incentive for people to get rid of it in the cheapest possible way. It's a total race to the bottom. Um, 
And, you know, we also have to look at the U.S. Um, you know, we see these conditions in Asia, which are horrific. Um, if we choke off that export model, which I think is appropriate, and contain it all in our state, we're going to see all this crap piling up somewhere. And um, let me tell you, recycling in the U.S. is, is no pretty picture either. So, um, you know, thanks to folks who've been trying to keep that you know, uh, uh, regulated and, and controlled. Um, in Berkeley, uh, just to get to the ordinance real quick, um, some of the driving factors, uh, who, uh, people in here worked on these stormwater regs, thank you. It helped tremendously. Um, city had just installed 209 waste capture devices at a tremendous cost to try and comply and then passed uh, a, a new um, property tax to pay for maintenance of those, $2 million a year. People were not happy. Public Works Department got this issue immediately when we brought it to them. Five years ago, they would have been like, what, food where? Ah. Um, the business districts also were tremendously helpful in getting this ordinance passed in Berkeley. Um, and part of that is just they're spending a ton of money cleaning up the streets. I've lived here most of my life. The streets in Berkeley are cleaner than I've ever seen them. But we've got like literally 20 full-time people picking up trash. In the T-bid, they picked up 75 tons one piece at a time last year. So um, they, were, they were pretty ready to go. Um, Councilmember Hahn, you know, when she ran in 2016 and was elected in that horrific election or wonderful election, depending on whether you're looking local or national, you know, she said she wanted some reduction. She didn't want to just invest in more infrastructure. She wanted reduction policies. And so we went to work and, and you know, we're lucky here in the Bay Area to have so many organizations and activists and smart people um, who helped. Um, some of you are in the room, Miriam especially, but... Um, you know, it wouldn't have happened without all of this. And I also want to point out the role specifically of um, the zero waste classroom and having um, third graders who are incredibly articulate involved in this process. Uh, we created three um, subcommittees and really got to work. Uh, there was a lot done at the business outreach level and at the consumer outreach level, petition gathering, um, social media press, all of that work. Um, at the business level, we did business surveys, one-on-one. -on -one spokesperson recruitment, um, site visits, follow-up, and, and Council Member Hahn and, and other council members actually went to the back of restaurants and talked to them. So it was really pretty deep and powerful stuff. Um, the legislative work, um, couldn't have done it without Miriam, amazing um, crafter of language and, and um, being able to fit these things together conceptually. For Are people familiar with what it does? Um, just a quick run through. Um, Already, it's accessory foodware, lids, straws, utensils, by request only. Um, no enforcement or even information has gone out to businesses about this yet, but a lot of them are already doing it. Um, the city's really focusing on January 1, 2020, which is when two other um, really big things come into play. All the foodware will be um, BPI certified compostable, um, so that will address our, oh, thank you. <laughs> that will address our um, 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 contamination in the recycling and composting. Uh, as, and then the charge is a 25 cent charge on cups. So this is trying to drive bring your own. Um, July 2020, reusable foodware for all in-house dining. This is kind of the one that really freaked out a lot of the small mom and pop shops. Um, but with uh, Clean Water Action's help, we were able to, to make sure that that, that stayed in. Um, there's some help that council is providing, technical assistance, um, mini grants, et cetera. We're really focused on the next phase, which is reusables. And um, so we just launched a, a pilot project with Vessel, which is a reusable cut program in and around the, the campus community. So I'm out of time, and I'll pass it over to Miriam. Ah, oh, sorry, here we go. Great, thanks Martin. So I'm Miriam Gordon and I am the program director for Upstream. We are a national NGO and uh, our mission is to find innovative solutions to plastic pollution and one of the ways that we do that is, it's been said so many times today, we sell ourselves, we go upstream in our focus on policy. And um, so, 
I, I'm just going to take you on a little journey with me uh, in policy from the waste end to the front end of the life cycle of plastics and single-use packaging, because um, that's where we need to go. We need to go upstream in its life cycle. When we look at what we need to focus on to solve this plastic pollution problem um, in our waterways, we need to look at what are the biggest sources, what are the biggest, what, what's the greatest uh, a number of products, because really our policies are fo focused on products. And we find that food and beverage packaging is um, by far, um, the, as a category, the biggest contributor. It's 14 of the top 20 marine uh, plastics, uh, marine plastic items found um, in the ban list 2.0 which is a, pro a project of uh, five gyres upstream and other organizations looking at various national data sets of the top uh, of the um, products that are found in shore and beach cleanups in California. So 14 of the top 20 marine plastic items are food and beverage packaging. It's 70% of street litter, according to a Bay Area litter study that I spearheaded when I was at Clean Water Action uh, with five different jurisdictions. It's 30% of the solid waste, municipal solid waste generated in the United States. Uh, so food and beverage, beverage packaging is the big kahuna. And if we're gonna um, address the problem at the source, we really need to focus on that. Um, what Martin uh, just said and what several others have said is that really the, um, uh, well, actually, I just want to go back for a second. When we talk about um, single-use food and beverage packaging, um, we're talking, and plastics, we're talking about products that are used in a matter of minutes, but have, but are then need to be discarded. And so uh, these are going to be our forever pollutants because, because they just keep degrading into smaller and smaller pieces, micro and nanoplastics, but they are not designed to disappear. They're designed to persist. Um, so is that the right way for us to be using our plastics? We have to ask ourselves. Policies to date have focused on the waste end. So our policies in California and all across the country are focusing on solid waste um, in terms of it being a landfill problem um, rather than a consumption problem. And so our policies are designed to promote diversion from landfill. And what that means essentially is recycling and composting rather than ending up in landfill. Um, and also another policy approach that has been discussed today is cleanup, uh, cleaning it up um, once it enters the marine environment or preventing it from entering the environment. So we're talking about all these things that happen once we have the problem at the end of life. Um, but what we're learning is that these approaches aren't working. We really can't recycle our way out of the food and beverage packaging mess. Um, for one thing, we've been trying for a really long time, and we've only uh, gotten to about 5% in this slide, 9% according to uh, many other statistics of plastics that are being recovered, and not all of that is actually being recycled. Um, but even if something is technically recyclable, even if it's made out of a kind of plastic that can be recycled, the real question is, is it being recycled? And um, you know, the China ban is, has really woke us to the fact that a lot of the paper and the plastics that we've been exporting don't have markets because they're dirty, they're contaminated, they're multi-material, and they're not really inherently recyclable. Even if they were, once they were contaminated with food, it's still dirty, and it's still going to be pulled out and still sent to the landfill. So it's really hard to design food and beverage packaging for recycling. So a lot of people want to move to compostable. But we're also learning, just as we're learning that we can't recycle our way out of this, we're also learning that we can't compost our way out of this. Because as the Oregon composters have said en masse, and as waste management has recently reported, um, and many of the commercial compost facilities out west are saying, um, we don't want your compostable foodware. We particularly don't want bioplastics because they don't degrade quickly enough. This is another case where in a lab setting, when you're looking for certification, yes, it can work. But out in the real world, it doesn't degrade quickly enough. Often it just degrades into smaller pieces of plastic that contaminates the compost. Um, so, and 
all of these commercial composters are saying what we really want is food waste and yard waste. That's the stuff that has nutrient, nutritive value that creates good quality compost. But when you put your PFAS coated fiberware and paperware in our compost and you put your bioplastics in our compost, we can't sell it. It doesn't really have value. So we're learning that um, really maybe this isn't the right way to approach food and beverage packaging. So as I've been saying, you know, we've been focusing at the bottom of this hierarchy, waste and stuff. Oh, no time remaining. Okay. What we really need to do is focus at the top and go upstream. So just a real quick review of what have we been doing. Is there a pointer here? Um, so I've been looking, I've been categorizing the policy approaches that we've been employing in California and if you, um, and looking at some of the things that have been enacted recently. And when you look at um, the different materials on the left and the percent of bay litter that they represent, some of these things are very, very small percentage. You know, like uh, polystyrene, which is one to two percent, or straws or utensils, you know, together five percent, or water bottles, one percent, or plastic bags, somewhere around five percent. The real kahuna are the cups and containers. Together, that food packaging is 40% of what's ending up on our streets as litter, according to the Clean Water Action Study. And so we have to look at what are, when we look at the outcome of our policies, what are we getting? Does the policy result in reducing the overall uh, materials that are being used um, and, and preventing them from ever becoming a waste that we have to clean up or recycle or compost? Or are we just choosing, are we just choosing um, alternative materials? So that's one thing I really wanted to drive home for you all, is that, yeah, we are here at a plastics, microplastic symposium. But sometimes when we just ban plastic, what we get are other single-use items made out of paper and fiberware. And those have bigger environmental impacts um, outside of the marine environment. So we have to look not only at whether we're reducing plastics in the environment, but are we reducing um, plastics and packaging overall so that we're not transferring our problem to climate or to, by cutting down more trees or growing more crops? So this is um, a bit complicated. I'll leave you with it. You'll have copies of it. But I want to say, if you look at the check marks, really the ones that are getting, that give us the most bang for the buck are the policies that aim at reducing the greatest number of products. And that would be, um, like the Ber Berkeley Ordinance, the cups and containers policy um, that gave us uh, reducing um, uh, a very large percentage of products, or that will anyway, and that have benefits not only in the marine environment, but in the environment overall. Um, so similarly, um, the microplastics ban actually um, just took that whole product category out of, I mean, personal care products, it took it out of the system completely. Um, so that benefits not only the marine environment, but the environment overall. And when it comes to SB 54 and um, AB 1080, you know, it seems like something that could really drive us towards uh, reduce, but this is going to be a five-year process of regulatory development. So really the devil is in the details. So what I wanted to end by saying is that for right now, <laughs> the really big wins are available at the local level in replicating the Berkeley ordinance. And we have um, the same ordinance but a new and improved version um, introduced in San Francisco right now and before the Board of Supervisors. Um, and so we have the opportunity for a really big win. And I brought with me postcards that if you are a San Francisco resident, you can send a postcard to your supervisor. I'll leave them out on the front table and ask you please to sign it. And, and anyone who wants to get involved in spreading these policies across the country, please do contact me. Thank you. So I'm next, I think. Hopefully, did I know? Okay. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about San Francisco's journey. And a theme you've been hearing today, starting with Chelsea and Miriam just mentioned it too, is that it all depends on what you're focused on. So the results that you achieve are 
a result, direct result of what you focus on. And so in San Francisco, for a very long time, we have been focused on our zero waste to landfill goal, right? So we were continuously aiming at shrinking the black bin and getting everything into the compost or the recycling stream. Very noble goal, but that has some, some consequences. And so in 2006, we passed an ordinance that looked at what was one of the big things that, going, that was going into our black bin, into our landfill-bound bin, and that was food containers, and that was primarily styrofoam. And so we passed an ordinance that banned styrofoam, and then we required compostables or recyclables to be used for takeout foodware. Good stuff. We actually have achieved pretty much that goal. And we have 85% diversion away from our landfill-bound bins and many more things going into the green waste and the uh, blue bin. So we also saw with that ordinance a really large market shift, a movement toward a lot of compostable products. And um, all of the work that I have just talked about has been our zero waste team. And one of the things that I started to do, because I work on toxics, was, oh, I'm really interested in what are, what are these other products that are coming into the market? Because we're seeing some, some innovations. We're seeing these molded fiber products. And that's great because all of the food soiled paper is supposed to go to our, our landfill, or I'm sorry, our compost bin. But they're not necessarily so familiar. They, they kind of look like egg cartons. There are these molded fibers, but unfortunately, they contain fluorinated chemicals, many of them. And this study from Silent Spring Institute indicates that about 40% of the paper and alternative fiber products contain fluorinated chemicals. And so that was really concerning to me and also to our zero waste team. What are we putting into compost? We're putting these forever chemicals, so a different forever chemical, into our compost stream. So how do we avoid these regrettable innovations? <laughs> A lot of people call them regrettable substitutes. Industry would call them innovations. They are actually meeting this new demand. Styrofoam is really, really cheap. And we need to find another compostable product that would be as inexpensive as that. But we uh, don't achieve that if we're not looking at the right problem. And so we really have to adjust our focus. We need to not be thinking about diversion, but instead reduction. And so in San Francisco, we have been thinking a lot more about how do we actually reduce overall all of this material. And so in last year, we passed the Toxics, Plastics, and Litter Reject Reduction Ordin Ordinance, which everyone knows as our plastic straw ban. But this actually had a lot more provisions in it than just plastic straws. So we banned plastic straws, that's true. But we also banned just the giving away of all these things that people may not necessarily need. So the ketchup packets and the cup tops and these weird little stirrers and these weird little things that you stick in the top of cup tops. All of those plastics that were single use and literally used maybe for seconds. We also added to that a provision that I worked on, which is our fluorinated chemicals ban. And so what we did with that was we require all of the compostables to be BPI certified, acknowledging that, yes, there will be takeout foodware. And if it is going to be paper-based, we want it to actually be certified compostable and not contain fluorinated chemicals. We worked with BPI to change their standard to address fluorinated chemicals because there was no way that all of these taquerias were going to go and test their own products. So we didn't get everything we wanted in that original ordinance. We were looking at things that would further reduce. But we are now taking another bite at the apple with Miriam leading that charge in San Francisco. Supervisor Peskin has introduced new legislation that would hopefully, hopefully will pass a single-use cup charge of 25 cents and then phasing in a charge for containers and then also phasing in reusables at restaurants so that if you're dining in, you will be eating off of a reusable plate or you know, some kind of cutlery. So with that, that's what we are doing. And I'm going to pass the baton to Chris. consulting firm out of Oakland that's been helping municipalities throughout the Bay Area for about the last 30 years with stormwater management. So now for something completely different. Um, we're not, I'm not going to talk about product bans or 
disposables or single-use products. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what was discussed earlier today that Dr. Gold brought up and then um, was talked by uh, uh, Mr. Bloomfield as well, um, is uh, the regulations around stormwater um, that have happened and two major efforts um, that I think you all find hopefully interesting, especially in the Bay Area, um, that municipalities have been enacting um, for the last um, about 10 years now, uh, 10, 15 years. And so first I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, the regulations that went back in, in 2009 went in place by the San Francisco Regional Water Quality Control Board um, that basically required trash reductions from all stormwater sources from municipalities. So this was a huge effort. It was a, probably the most monumental um, effort that uh, many of you probably have been involved with. It was uh, started in, in, in L.A. and then uh, kind of tweaked a little bit in the Bay Area and now has gone statewide. Um, so every municipality that has urbanized areas throughout the state now with the adoption of the statewide amendments um, has to reduce trash to a full capture or full capture equivalency level. Uh, that was described earlier. I'm going to show you what those, uh, those devices look like here in a second. Um, you know, there's basically like five, four categories of, uh, of actions that could take place um, to try to reduce trash in municipal stormwater. A lot of that's been talked about today, about kind of starting at the source. I think we all agree in the Bay Area's history around stormwater is get back to the source, try to reduce the sources of these impacts, whether it's copper and brake pads or whether it's plastics in, in stormwater. Um, I'm not going to talk about street sweeping and bore you with those discussions. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly on stormwater treatment. I think we all know about what <coughs> removal of waterways is. We've kind of lost the, um, lost the game if uh, uh, we, we get to that point. So this really comes into two places. One, green stormwater infrastructure, and two, the trash capture systems that have been put in um, place throughout the Bay Area. So give you an idea of the trash capture systems. They really come in two sizes. Um, one. Uh, these types of uh, um, systems that are screening devices, like these little stainless steel screens um, that are put in many of the catch basins, as was described earlier, in Berkeley. Um, there's tens of thousands of these now that have occurred over the last 10 years have been put in place throughout the Bay Area. They screen trash that's five millimeters inside and greater from moderate to small size storms. Um, and you can see that they're installed in the catch basins themselves or the inlets themselves. Then there's these massive uh, systems that are put in place as alternatives to um, those, those small systems treat about one acre of land or less. These systems treat in the tens to hundreds up to 1,000 acres. And it's basically straining or screening trash for five millimeters and greater that are coming through these systems. This one up at the top right here, this one is 40 feet deep um, that is in the city of San Jose at the cost of about a million and a half dollars in and of itself. It treats almost 1,000 acres of land in, in the city of San Jose. Just from a geographical standpoint, I work with San Mateo and Santa Clara counties mostly, um, and so I have good data on the kind of the level of implementation that's happened there. Um, you've got about 235,000 acres um, of urbanized area um, within those two county, county, counties, and you can see the area in blue is what's actually treated by these full capture systems now. All of this has happened over roughly the last eight years, eight to ten years, um, at tens of millions of dollars that cities have put into place to try to basically uh, um, comply with the trash requirements um, that are out there. Um, switch gears real quick, just as background. Um, you know, there's two main issues that we have when we pave things over an urbanized area. One, we create impervious surfaces. Those impervious surfaces increase runoff from 10 percent pre-development conditions <laughs> to greater than 50% um, during developed conditions. And that's because water can't infiltrate into the ground anymore. When it does that, it causes massive amounts, higher volumes and flows of water that come off of that land, which also erodes our creeks um, downstream as well. And it carries pollutants, because now we have a very easy conveyor belt um, and conduit for those pollutants to get to our local waterways. Uh, microplastics can be one of those, because now you've created this transport system. So what does green stormwater do and what is it? Um, it basically tries to mimic the natural environment. So it's infiltrating or filtering water. Uh, you saw a picture that Alicia showed earlier of a um, cutaway um, of one of those systems, a bioretention system or a rain garden system. Um, and it, the storms that they treat in the Bay Area are about 80% of the annual runoff. So it's quite a, quite a bit. Here's a few examples of those um, types of systems really quick. 
You've got just down the street, pervious pavement and right in front of Berkeley High, one of the largest applications I think that I'm aware of in, the, in California. Um, these planters that have downspouts coming from the, um, the roofs, you've got these cutaways. You'll see a lot of this stuff out in the urban environment now. Like, Why is this look, what is this thing? Um, you basically are not um, diverting water to the catch basin, those, those screens that I showed you earlier. It's going into these planter systems now and infiltrating. These are larger systems. Here's our sales, new Salesforce Park in San Francisco. It's actually a green roof, um, if you think about it from a green infrastructure standpoint. Um, and here's regional capture systems. Um, there's that map again. Now I'm going to put green infrastructure on top about it. This is already in place in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties in this picture. Many other applications throughout the Bay Area that have happened already. Thousands of acres. Um, you're about 15% of either trash capture or green infrastructure now of that land that's treated um, by this. So these are massive undertakings. I do want to point out one thing is that we have, under the last 10 years, undergone a massive redevelopment process because of the economic viability that has happened in these two counties. So most of this green infrastructure has happened because of private redevelopment. So it's happened on the parcels themselves, not on the streets. The investments into streets and how we prioritize those, I just want to mention this real quick. Um, these were just submitted to the Water Board by all municipalities throughout the Bay Area on Monday. Um, every municipality in the Bay Area is required uh, that's under this permit, the MRP, the regional permit, has to submit a green infrastructure plan that prioritizes new green infrastructure projects um, and looks at the targets associated with the impervious surface retrofits. This is a huge undertaking that cities have gone, gone on. It's planning all the way out to 2040. And so now, the, now the, 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 um, the next step is where does the funding come from to actually get these plans in place. And that's where the policy initiatives, I think, have to come in place. One, build off of what we've done. Um, two, let's find funding. It can't just happen from the locals. It, can, it needs to happen at the statewide level. It needs to happen at the federal level. And that's, that's not just for infrastructure installations and construction, but O&M is never funded. And O&M, for any of these uh, operation maintenance of these systems, is critical to their performance. And it's always funded through the local um, agencies themselves, which have a lack of funding in O&M of themselves. Um, and then I, I agree, this is a, it's kind of a parallel approach here that we're looking at source reduction, treatment, and other types of actions as well. So those, all of this has to happen to, to make microplastics and macro trash to both uh, decrease over time. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Sherry Lippiat. I'm the California Regional Coordinator for the NOAA Marine Debris Program. Um, and so I'm going to take kind of more of a step back and talk about how federal efforts fit in and can support local initiatives. Um, so first, uh, federal marine debris legislation that has been passed. Um, in 2006, the Marine Debris Act uh, established the NOAA Marine Debris Program and designated us as the federal lead on addressing this issue. Um, and it's important to point out that we are non-regulatory and have no enforcement authority. Um, in, in 2012, the Marine Debris Act was amended and together those laws um, provide the following mandates for NOAA. To identify, determine sources of, assess, prevent, reduce, and remove marine debris, provide national and regional coordination, grants for marine debris projects, conduct outreach and education, address severe marine debris events. Um, in 2008, so late last year, the Save Our Seas Act was signed into law. Um, so that reauthorized the NOAA Marine Debris Program at the same authorized appropriation level of $10 million and provided additional mandates on interagency collaboration on outreach and promoting international action. So our grant programs are um, an important way that we support uh, local projects. So uh, our, our prevention grant opportunity is focused on projects that raise awareness and lead to lasting changes in behavior. So these are often focused on reducing the use of single-use disposable items. Um, this grant opportunity is open now, and the letters of intent are due November 5th. Uh, we also have a research grant opportunity focused on better understanding the impacts of marine debris and advancing the state of the science. Um, and in recent years, those uh, projects have been focused on ecological risk assessment at uh, population level impacts, so like Suzanne was talking about this morning, exposure response studies, and fate and transport. And then lastly, we have a, a removal grant opportunity focused on removing debris that is impacting NOAA Trust resources. 
Um, I'm going to kind of skip this in the interest of time, but bottom line, data is important. Um, and, and I'll really just focus on the California Ocean Litter Strategy. Um, so development of these regional marine debris action plans is an important way to bridge national and, and local initiatives and to really um, message those local priorities up to national decision makers. And as we've heard, you know, I think a lot of the rest of the country really looks to California to, as leaders on this issue. Um, so I think it's especially important here in California. And um, we've had the, the pleasure of partnering with Ocean Protection Council on uh, developing this strategy, bringing stakeholders together. And we had a couple of um, goals in mind for, for the process. So first, updating and expanding a 2008 OPC strategy. And so that strategy was really focused on state agency actions, and we expanded that to include actions that various stakeholders could contribute to and updated it after 10 years had passed. Um, we really hope to improve coordination among organizations that are working on marine debris in California, galvanize new action on addressing the issue, provide a mechanism to track progress over time, and as I mentioned, um, inform, inform decision makers. Um, so, you know, speaking for, for NOAA grant opportunities, we try to prioritize um, projects for our funding that are, are within these action plans. So it's a, a six-year strategy um, and has uh, six different stakeholder goals with 64 specific actions. Um, a quick summary of the, the goals themselves. Um, there's a, a clear emphasis on source reduction with the first goal focused on policies and incentives at the point of sale for common ocean litter items. The second goal is focused on extended producer responsibility and changes in product design. The third goal is focused on uh, waste management and interception of litter on land, as Chris was just talking about. Uh, goal four is research, and, uh, research into existing and emerging issues, and so there's a big emphasis here on microplastics. Goal five is focused on uh, behavior change and consumer education to reduce the, the purchase of common ocean litter items. And then the last goal is focused on um, our ocean-based debris prevention and cleanup. Um, so, so OPC and NOAA um, are continuing to, to engage stakeholders in the process uh, through regular progress reporting, webinars, and newsletters, and we're, we're planning a workshop next summer. Um, and just last, I'll pitch that we, we have a listserv for updates um, on all of those actions as well as different funding opportunities as they become available. Um, so definitely encourage folks to, to check that out. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time for questions. It's tough to give five brilliant people five minutes to save the world. Um, but we are going to take a five-minute break for people to stretch their legs. We will have a two-hour social where you can accost them with all of your questions and, and ideas. As you're standing up to leave, though, I did just want to call attention out to a groundbreaking new film that really goes deep into s some of the justice issues associated with our broken recycling system and how that affects overseas countries. Uh, attention to Stiv Wilson in the back of the room as the director of that film called The Story of Plastic. Okay, the, the brainchild of the film, and it's premiering at the Mill Valley Film Festival on October 6th. Check it out, and now go take a break. Thank you. And if you're a San Francisco resident, come fill out a postcard.